are back. So, um, mm. gosh, you know, Tim, I, uh, I just, I found a declassified memo today. <laughs> I think we all did. I think I found a declassified memo. It, uh, it was instructing me to pick up milk. <laughs> That's my declassified memo. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, so we we didn't we, we haven't really weighed in on the Oscars yet. What uh, your general feeling? And there's uh, and I wrote a piece noms. by the way. We're talking about the nom the nominations. Yeah. And I wrote a piece by the way. Uh, diversity versus diversity. Just Great kind piece. of weighing in a little bit on uh, cinegods.com. So go check that out. I'll, we'll we'll all have some musings about the Oscars as we draw close to the awards. But. Um, yeah, thoughts yeah. on the nominations? We're sort of into the middle of the Guild Awards right now. The nominations are solid across the rock, uh, across the board. Let me uh, let me say this: uh, ten slots, nine Best Picture nominations. Yeah. Empty slot there. Yeah, I can think of a couple of movies to put in that slot. Sure, you know, you know, I'm a big Florida Project fan. Um, I, you know, and I, Tanya and, and, I, and, uh, you know, and I, yeah, 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 easily. And so you don't have to knock anybody out. Yeah. To add a couple of movies that I really would like, sure. Uh, so it's not one of those sort of situations. When we get down to the other categories, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I find myself in a situation where I would not swap anybody for somebody I would prefer. There are things I would prefer. Adam Sandler, I thought, was pretty sure. outstanding in uh, Meyerowitz. Yeah. Stories, uh, best supporting actor. Sure, love to see him nominated for that. But I wouldn't bump anybody. Yeah, that's on that list to nominate him. I just wish she was nominated. I, and as I work my way down that list, I can do that again and again and again. But I'm not bumping anybody out. Mo Molly's game for me. I would have loved to see Jessica Chastain yeah. get that uh, Meryl Streep slot, which seems to be reserved every year for Meryl. For, for Meryl, it's yeah. at this point. I mean, she's see, good. I, I want to see. I want to see Jessica on the list, but I don't want Meryl off. The list. Yeah. I actually don't. I actually really like that performance, uh, and it's a you know it's a stately, uh, solid as a rock. Meryl, uh, her, Helen. I can think of who are her and Helen to the pull that off. Who else? Somebody has off? to come in sixth and seventh yeah. and eighth, and you yeah. never know. Yeah, it's, but see, it is. Yeah, those people. We always talk about uh, people or uh, movies being snubbed. Yeah, I don't think anyone was snubbed. Nobody gets snubbed. No, this is just a situation of where you didn't have to get nominated. That's yeah. all. But you weren't snubbed; you just weren't nominated. Yeah, it's not the same thing. Yeah. Um, but as you know, what I like most about the list of nominations, you work your way down that list and you find yourself. And then when you work your way through the list deeply, yeah. not just the major categories, yeah. but your production designs and your screenplay yeah. and adapted screenplay writing, you find brown and black people and women and Asian people and Mexican first, people every freaking way. First ever female nominee for best cinematography. Rachel Morrison. Uh, you know, which is a big deal, a big, 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 big deal. People are a little upset that Dee Rees, director of Mud Mountain, didn't yeah. catch a nom as best director. She got a nomination as be uh, a co-nomination, you know, best adapted screenplay for Mud Mountain. And and you know, there's I, I have a theory there too. And and people have to remember, you know, as I used to, as I said to my class when I when I taught film history, the Oscars are not a barometer of objective truth. There is no, this is the best film, and these are the best films. You, you can't get upset with that. It's political, and it, it's a barometer of, all it tells you, it's a snapshot of what the, the members of the Academy, who are theoretically supposed to represent the elite of the business, what they value among their own at any given point in time. Mm -hmm. And the nominations are, you know, n branches nominate. So some branches are more political than others. For the longest time, there was an, uh, a ridiculous bias in the uh, in the composers, uh, you know, in the music in the music branch, where you know it's small enough that the composer can kind of work his buddies and, and get nominated. And you know, Michael Nyman for the piano not nominated. Uh, for the longest time in the cinematographers branch, you had to be one of a certain elite group, and and being an American cinematographer. Yeah. Who who was not you know uh, Haskell Wexler yeah. was was on, it was almost impossible. So I mean there are all kinds of weird clicks that you know you have to sort of account for, and those seem to be changing or at least breaking down. Yeah, well you know the the, the nature of the Academy itself. People forget that the Academy was conceived as an organization to promote motion pictures. Yeah, and subvert unions. Yeah, it's a it's a gigantic press organization. Of course it, it is. It's what it is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, all of the calculus in all of the nominations, the calculus in all of the nominations is about what will get a whole lot of people to watch these movies, watch this show. Well, they've been doing a crappy industry, job for 10 years. Better, you know, it's not... <laughs> 
Well, yeah, even, you know, the, maybe even longer. Maybe yeah. Even, you know, I can remember when people like uh, David Niven and Johnny Carson hosted the Academy Awards. Yeah. I had no problem with Jimmy Kim- Kimmel. He's great. You know, it's kind of like having Johnny Carson. but Well, it, it's, it, you know, movies need to step it up. And uh, we say that on a regular basis. Look, we, we you know, the... It, it used to be that that was the only entertainment game in town, and it was something extraordinary. And now when people can make YouTube videos and mm. post them and, and get millions of people to watch them instead of a movie, you, you, they have to step it up. they got to find the next step, you know? Streaming this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. Plus my TV is gigantic. So. And we, we there are workmen working nearby here. Yeah. So if you hear we, – we don't do this in a uh, soundproof <laughs> studio, folks. So uh, if there's some hammering and banging, then that's just how it goes. I'm going to start off. I'm going to blow through a bunch of uh, kid vid. Oh, Haven't done that in a it? while. My daughter just turned five. Can't believe it. Well, Those who've yeah. listened to this show for any period of time will probably be amazed as well. Yes, indeed, I have a five-year-old now. And uh, she doesn't stop talking ever. <laughs> I don't. Uh, those of you, gods at digigods.com, uh, gods at digigods.com, please, please tell me, um, is, is this a, a unusual for a five year old that literally from the moment that she wakes up until the moment she falls asleep, there is not a breath taken? I thought that was about two, uh, two years. That was not two year olds. That's five year olds. Five. She just doesn't stop talking about I was, everything. Uh, I was an elementary school teacher, but I never, but I, Five. I never did kindergarten. Kids. When you grow up, you realize that not every single thought needs to be verbalized, and probably <laughs> most of them should not be. Not so when you're five. Uh, everything that comes into her head comes right out of her mouth. Uh, Absolutely everything. Um, so anyway, let's uh, let me bounce through a few of these things here. Uh, my daughter loves Minnie. She has never stopped loving Minnie. She is all into Minnie and a little bit into Daisy, but Minnie. She's big on Minnie. Uh, this is Disney Mini Helping Hands uh, from Disney Junior. Uh, essentially, this is the Mickey's Playhouse version of Minnie and Daisy. And uh, there are eight episodes in this uh, spin off show, uh, which is perfectly sweet and fine. Um, you know, it's the, this is how a large segment of the youth today know Mickey Mouse mm-hmm. and Minnie. They don't know them from the shorts, from the original movies, from you know, uh, Fantasia or anything. They just know them from TV, from these CG animated shows, which I have begun to watch an awful lot of, I, I'm sad to say. Uh, it's perfectly fine. You know, this this skews to a certain group. Uh, the best of Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, Neighborhood Friends Collection. Not, you know, hugely into Daniel Tiger. This is from PBS Kids. Uh, part of the Fred Rogers legacy over there. Uh, skews much younger than than five. I'll say that if you this this is kind of more a three year old. My daughter never really got into this, but it's uh, it also has a following. A uh, bunch of Nickelodeon stuff today, all of which continues to uh, kind of have a have a weird following. Hey Arnold, the Jungle Movie. Um, hey Arnold. You know, did you ever watch this? You, you, I, you know, I would with, with my little with my niece when she was a little girl. Yeah, we'd do I, a little Hey Arnold. I thought it was, you know, I liked it. I, it, don't know. I guess. I mean, I I guess I I never. Th- this was part of a certain moment in Nickelodeon where I think you probably if you weren't a kid of a certain age and you didn't grow up with it, you wouldn't appreciate it. Yeah. Um. Same kind of goes for Rugrats. Rugrats yeah, had its same. moment. Yeah. We got Rugrats uh, three and four here. Um, watch a little bit of this again. And, you know, it does hold up, but the style of animation is definitely one of a different era. Kind of belongs to that Hey Arnold era. Yeah, the flat. Ren, the Ren and Stimpy, right? Yeah. Where it's flat, it's 2D, but everything's just a little bit misshapen yeah. and kind of exaggerated. and it Squiggles around a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's, there, there was a moment where that was the thing in animation. Dr. Um, Cats. A good friend of mine from school was uh, was uh, worked on Rugrats for quite a while and uh, learned a great deal. Um, yeah, and they made the, you know the Rugrats movie. I mean, it was popular enough to do a feature film. Uh, there's lots here. This is uh, they had previously released seasons one and two. Now we're into seasons three and four. Um, and the show does get better as it goes along. Uh, some cute episodes here. The mysterious Mister Friend was a really good one from season three. And uh, there were a couple in season four that I, I really enjoyed. America's Wackiest Home Movies, I thought was very, very clever. And uh, The Turkey Who Came to Dinner, also very entertaining. Uh, we have uh, live action here, Jojo Siwa, My World. Uh, this is also from Nickelodeon. This is the, uh, I, I, I really don't know who Jojo is, I'm going to be <laughs> honest. But this is her concert. And... Um, Apparently, this is like a, she's like a, what Britney Spears once was or uh, something. Like anyway. now? 
Well, I, she's you know she's like she was on YouTube and then oh, she became a Nickelodeon. Th- yeah, yeah, she's okay. a yeah. Anyway, no she's got a big bow in her hair and uh, yeah. I I don't even go over there, dude. I don't yeah. even go over there. Anyway, it's a concert from all of America, and uh, I'm sure if I were like an eight year old girl, you 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 you're talking to a person who who once uh, about about ten years ago now. Covered the premiere of that Jonas Brothers movie. Oh dear! The concert Jonas yeah. Brothers movie. Yeah. And I'm standing there. I'm covering the premiere. I got the microphone, and this kid, shaggy hair, walks up to me, and I look at you know he's on the other side of the red, and I'm, I, I said, hey man, uh, uh, can you can you tell me who one of these Jonas Brothers are? <laughs> can you point one of them out to me? He says, well, you're talking to one now. <laughs> oh dear! I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> sorry, sorry, dude. He's like, that's all right, man. You don't have any reason to know who I am. Uh, so, you know, anyway, that's where I live. Good times. Oh, uh, well, sorry. His, it was Nick. It was Nick, by the way. Hey, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that day, bro. Uh, we, another one from Nickelodeon, Shimmer and Shine. I love Shimmer and Shine. I'll, I'll, I'll be unabashed about that. And I, and I think the reason I love Shimmer and Shine is because it's they're genies. They're, uh, they're cute little genies. Yeah. And anything relate, that brings back I Dream of Genie in my mind, I'm, I'm all about. <laughs> Uh, Shimmer and Shine, Beyond the Rainbow Falls. And they're also part of that whole Nick thing, like the bubble guppies with the big eyes, yeah. big heads, yeah. cute little bodies. Yeah. Kind of like that artwork. I don't know why. Very I know why children love it, that's for sure. It's cute. Uh, so you've got seven episodes here from uh, the, uh, the, the wonderful Shimmer and Shine, Beyond the Rainbow Falls in the world of Rainbow Zarame. Uh, it's cute animation, very clever little stories. And, uh, you know, you have like hairdos and don'ts. Flower power, water bent, whatever floats your boat. Um, it's it's cute, cute show and uh, cute animation. I I can recommend that. Got a couple of things from uh, Mill Creek. Uh, little vintage shows in complete series sets. Horseland and uh, Street Sharks. Now this goes back a little ways. Um, not far enough back for me to necessarily remember when they came on, but I have like a vague recollection. Uh, street Sharks, of course. You remember Street Sharks? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Paradigm yeah. and, yeah, you know, basically. I remember the little, I think it was Mattel or something like that. The, with the little actual, yeah, it yeah. was, it was yeah. kind of like a, it's sort of like a, a weird mutated DNA thing that prefigures the, the, the giant yeah, shark yeah, on the yeah, flash. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a little bit on the the rough edge. I, you know, this is like probably good for some tweaked boys. This was back in the '90s, <laughs> so those kids now are gonna be I don't know in their 30s, um, and you'll probably be just as tweaked uh, and watching it. Um, Horseland's not bad. I was ready to kind of rip on this thing and go, oh, it's My Little Pony. And it, and no, actually, it's not bad. Um, yeah, it's got talking horses and a bunch of kids, and it's kind of kind of dorky and goofy, but. Um, <laughs> And actually, uh, in terms of, you know, being educational about how to care for horses and encouraging, you know, respect for horses, I, it's, it's, it, it, it survives. It's, uh, it, it still kind of resonates a little bit. Mm. Uh, and then uh, let's jump into, uh, let's see here. I'm going to do this one. Uh, this is from the uh, the Miffy's Adventures line. This is Playdate with Miffy. This skews really, really young. This is super preschool age um, stop motion stuff. Um, Eleven stories here. Really, really skews young. It's just you know Miffy's a little little bunny and has little bunny friends. I prefer Peppa Pig. My daughter loved Peppa Pig when yeah. she was really little. Still does. Peppa Pig really resonates. But uh, this skews a lot younger, and it's 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 cute-ish. It's kind of like uh, Teletubbies not on LSD. <laughs> so uh, play date with Miffy uh, for your preschooler, your super young preschooler would be perfectly fine. Uh, Disney's Vampirina. I never thought I'd say those words. This is from Disney Junior. I'm going to talk about this in the same breath with Howard Lovecraft. We're a little bit a little creepy here. Uh, so on DVD we have Vampirina, which. Feels like they they're trying to take a little vampire girl and make her into what they into like a Doc McStuffins thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. That's not that's not a good idea. I don't know who really thought this up, but it's uh, it's kind of weird and it's a little bit creepy. A uh, little vampire girl. Not not really down with her being cute with the little bat wing shaped pigtails. Yeah. It's no mm-mm, no. This is uh, this is trying trying to put a good face on something that's not that cute. Uh, it's like, you know, Vampira before when she was a little girl. It's yeah, just no, no. Too weird. Um, this one 
is a little bit more interesting. This is from Shout Factory. This is Howard Lovecraft and the Undersea Kingdom. Uh, great voice work, including Mark Hamill and Christopher Plummer. Uh, Blu-ray and DVD combo set. This uh, didn't get a, a great deal of play theatrically, and it I think it probably should have. Um, it's actually uh, kind of goes in line with a lot of this. Uh, who did the um, – what's the animation factory that's just up here up north in Washington – it oh. does like uh, all the James and the Giant Peach stuff type stuff. The oh, stop I motion. The name of it, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's kind of in line with that with uh, with with that stuff. Anyway, um, it doesn't really have much to do with with Lovecraft, the original Lovecraft uh, author. Um, this is based on a graphic novel, and uh, it's it it's it's eerie, it's creepy, but it's not too much. So it's very creative. Probably skews more. Um, nine, ten-year-old kids. That's probably the better, uh, better age for something like this. Um, but it's very, very, uh, it's very creative and very nicely done. So I, I, I would like to have seen this kind of undersea adventure and this little kind of kid-oriented macabre get a get a better theatrical release. It did not because it was not released by a major studio, and that's always a handicap these days. Skellington. Skellington. I think what? that's the name of that production company. No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a complete blank yeah, now. Yeah. But um, anyway, Queen for a Day. This is from the uh, Disney Tangled series. And uh, Tangled never should have been a series, but it is. So we get a few episodes from the Tangled series, which is perfectly fine. Um, it's not really 3D animation. It's not really 2D animation. It's kind of somewhere in between. Mm. And that's fine. Uh, show's okay. Uh, they really shouldn't have done this as a show, but they make the best of it, nonetheless. And uh, last few Disney's Ducktales, yeah, which I still enjoy, even though even its new incarnation. This is uh, s- they have six bonus shorts on here as well. Uh, the um, this is Woo Oo and W O O dash O O. Kind of a weird title for this thing. Uh, Ludwig von Drake and Huey, Dewey and, 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 and Huey, Dewey, and Louie. A lot of fun. Uh, Scrooge McDuck. A lot of fun. I, uh, I still, I still like the whole duck thing. <laughs> PBS Kids, Super Why, Sleeping Beauty, and Other Fairy Tale Adventures. Super Why is great for teaching kids how to learn, how to read and stuff. Uh, it really is. It's very formulaic. It's very straightforward, but it's been really good for my daughter. And this has four reading adventures on it based on Sleeping Beauty, Frog Prince, uh, The Twelve Dancing Princesses, and Princess Gwenny. And uh, they're really great. I, I really like the uh, the whole uh, Super Why thing. It's really grown on me. Uh, young yeah. I- it, it kind of, You can m- kind of morph from that into Young Einsteins very easily. Yeah. Last few here, Regal Academy, Rose Cinderella in Fairy Tale Land. As long as we're talking about fairy tales, uh, this skews a lot older. This is Teenage Girls. Uh, you know, it, it's it, you may not. I don't know. It depends if you want your teenage daughter watching super, super hyper fashionable um, teenage cartoon princesses, which will, <laughs> you know, you're gonna you're gonna be buying a lot of new stuff. Yeah. Uh, I would think twice. This has three episodes in it. Um, each of them roughly twenty some minutes long. And uh, yeah, I could kind of enjoy this, but at the same time, you know, I don't think I would let a teenage yeah, girl uh, yeah. near that show. Yeah. And then the last two, much more my speed. Cartoon Network, Steven Universe, the complete first season. Uh, I actually think this is really cool. 52 episodes. 52 episodes in the first season. Featurettes, musical performances, the whole thing. Uh, I really, I thoroughly enjoy the, uh, the Steven Universe thing. I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's cool and funny. And uh, I like the whole musical aspect to it. So um, I recommend that. Definitely check that out. And then uh, I didn't even know about this. Static Shock, the complete third season, DC. Uh, this is from Warner Brothers. Static Shock. You, you familiar with Static oh, Shock? Oh, yeah. I didn't know about Static yeah, Shock. Yeah. I, actually, I didn't. I know about it as a cartoon, but, uh, but that's, fairly, that's fairly recent stuff. Yeah. Static Shock, yeah. Static Shock. Cool hero, cool superhero thing. Fighting, you know, he's yeah. it's sort of a teenage Black Lightning kind of guy. Yes, it, and and we you know get a little uh, goes to Gotham City here, and we get a little a uh, little Batman crossover with Poison Ivy and Batman and Harley Quinn. Yeah, it's great. Brainiac shows up. It's uh, it's cool, uh, cool little DC hero action that I was not familiar with. So Static Shock third season, check him out. He's cool, definitely cool. And, uh, as, as we have Black Panther coming up, that's another, uh, which you have uh, seen and I have not. Yeah, uh, yeah what's, they, what's the word on Black Panther? Well, you know, yeah, if, uh, embargo. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, <dang laughs> the it. word is embargo. Uh, I, but I, but I will it. say this about it. 
It's very good. Michael B. Jordan walks away with that movie. I won't say anything. Sweet. Walks very away. sweet. Fantastic. Good to know. Uh, Going to do some music? Do some music. Uh, on, 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 on Blu-ray here, Bee Gees, uh, One for All Tour, uh, live in Australia, 1989. So this was the, the last of three tours, uh, yeah. of three concerts that they did in 1989. By 1989, I was a little bit over the Bee Gees. I wasn't. Uh, uh, in 1979, though, I was at, I was, I was, I was, I, they, I'm they still not St. over Louis. the Bee Gees. Uh, the, you know, I, I, I love my Bee Gees. I love my Bee Gees. But in that late 70s, that whole yeah. run there, yeah. you know. Uh, at th in this tour and, and on this and on this DVD, they you know they, they got tracks going back to their stuff in the late '60s. Oh wow! So if you're you know if you're a BG guy, how many? What would you only? We only got Barry left. Is Barry That's the last? It. Barry's the last Barry's one. The last one. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna do anyway. This is pretty neat. Uh, and if you're a BG's fan, it's, it's pretty much a must-have. So you're gonna want to go to uh, go ahead and get hold of that for sure. Uh, the gospel songs of Bob Dylan. You know. Uh, Got to serve somebody. Uh, Bob, you know, Bob has done a lot of interesting things over the course of his career. Of course, there was that moment when he went electric. Yeah. Uh, and then he ro roamed around with the traveling Wilburys for it's a while there. Such, then... He's such a lovably eccentric, yeah. self-deprecating guy. And then Bob, uh, the Jew, uh, decided yeah. that he wanted to be an uh, evangelical Christian. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, and he made a record full of gospel songs, uh, which are actually pretty good. This is full of all kinds of appearances, you know, the Neville brothers and... Yeah. And Shirley Caesar, and uh, and they're singing original songs, or, you know, c uh, contemporary to the, and as as well as some. Um, uh, so you know, this is neat. I don't know, Bob Dylan, uh, you know, doing gospel yeah. music. I, I, I had to I had to let it go. We've been talking about music <laughs> uh, back and forth. You, you and a couple of the guys, and, and Mark. Yeah, because Mark, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I had to let it go. You know, here's the thing about Bob Dylan. My my favorite Bob Dylan moment was when he won the Nobel. Mm hmm. And everybody's like, oh, my gosh, Bob Dylan won Nobel, Bob. Oh, everybody's waiting for Bob Dylan to, uh, to weigh in on his Nobel. And for it was, it was like three or four days. <laughs> and, people, and, and everyone went from being, oh, Bob, like, Bob, you're being a jerk, man. Are you going to accept this or not? Say thank you or say something, anything. What, you just running silent? And after, after about like five or six days, Bob comes in and sort of says, yeah, uh, I, really, I really appreciate this. I'm really honored. Uh, thank you very much. And that was it. Yeah. And he, I think he did fly over to accept it, but he's just a real. Private. I know he, he sent uh, Petty. Oh, that's right. That's he sent right. Petty Smith. Yeah. To do what? Sing, sing, sing or, or read a poem. Uh, she did something. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, I, I, I just I find him so refreshing and not programmed. Uh, yeah. Look. Uh, yeah. I, 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 Bob can do whatever the hell Bob wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's what. When, we, when, he, when he started singing gospel music, I'm like, you know what? Uh -huh. I got my my family church is around the corner. I'm going down there and t take care of that, Bob. I got it. I got it. Yeah, knock that one out for me. Oh, yeah. We got uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Didone uh, Aban, uh, Abandonata. Yeah, that's why I wanted you to do it. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm completely destroying that. This is, uh, this is uh, effectively an opera uh, in three acts uh, about Leonardo da Vinci. And I did not know that this even existed. Uh, they find the damnedest things to make operas about these days, I, like you know Nixon in China. I remember when that thing happened, and then the death of Clay yeah. Hoffer, and I'm like, yeah. okay, you're you're pretty much making an opera about anything. Wade goes shopping. Write me an opera. Yeah, Write I mean me the opera. death of Clay, which is you know, I mean Clay Hoffer, the guy yeah. with the wheelchair and the thing like. But yeah. I, this is an opera. Yeah, you're, 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 you realize we could very well wind up with a Trump the opera. <laughs> that, I would not put that past somebody. Opera to used write to that involve up. It, you know Valkyries. It would be yeah. winged, but you know whatever. So anyway, uh, I I've, I've always found. The uh, I've always found Da Vinci to be a fascinating figure. I'm not sure that Da Vinci in opera makes a lot of sense to me, but uh, it's fine. I mean, if you're if you're an opera fan, it's probably a, a, a nice little curiosity item to check it out. But I wouldn't buy it, rent it yeah. if you can find somebody that rents. I it. I don't know. Uh, True Born African. Uh, Winston Flames Jarrett is uh, is one of the founding pioneers of not just reggae, but frankly, the precursor to reggae ska. Mm. Uh, uh, because people very often sort of like confuse those things. This is a this is a documentary uh, mostly told in his own words. Uh, you know, this is mostly Winston sitting there in a chair and roaming around through his life. Lots of archival footages and some performances right. and all that kind of stuff. And you know, um, ska is a music that I more appreciate than like reggae. You know, the, the rhythm of reggae is actually more my thing. It's uh, it's interesting to me how because there've been a, a number of building blocks. And ska obviously informs reggae, but reggae has now informed a lot of stuff. Yeah. I mean, if you listen to, you know, I'm a big No Doubt fan. Yeah. If you listen to, to No Doubt's first album, especially, yeah. 
there is reggae and ska influence all, all over, over that, that thing, thing all yeah. over that thing yeah. and um and you know obviously it, it became a big deal in the, a lot of a lot of stuff in the in the 80s a lot of bands uh, kind of took that lead and ran with it. Yeah. Uh, good stuff, you know. Uh, Blue Hats Creative Presents. L7. I loved L7. Look, feminist punk ass uh, rock and roll. You know, just just ridiculously hot uh, transgressive chicks uh, just refusing to participate. It's funny uh, that here now in this yeah. movement, that this Me Too movement, this, you yeah. know, this thing that's going on, uh, uh, that uh, this kind of stuff uh, sort of has a different sort of set to it now, yeah. a different sort of feel to it now. True. Uh, chicks, you, we, we wonder why some of these young women, all the way back, you know, uh, I'm a big Joan Jett and a Black Hearts sure. fan, you know, I'm all the, you know, all that kind of stuff. We wonder about these 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 women from back in the day who were so uh, refusing to participate in the sort of male patriarchal. S- well, that's why. Yeah, uh, that's why the, the, the women. These women came out of that. They saw what the world was shaped like, particularly the music world. Yeah, and they said, you know what, girls, <laughs> we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do this our own way. Yeah, uh, and poke some dudes in the eye. And I love that. Anyway, this is uh, this Blu-ray DVD deluxe set, two full documentaries, loads and loads of bonus materials, uh, and. and Including Chris Novoselic's documentary, The Beauty Process, which is really great. Bonus material, live songs, deleted scenes, much, much more. L7, a band I truly love. Terrific. All right, uh, let's do some new movies. Um, you know, Woody Woodpecker, I don't, uh, where did this thing come from? <laughs> uh, this is, this was like, I, I just, I don't even, was this ever going to get a theatrical release? What was the story on this? This is a, yeah. this is basically a CGI Woody Woodpecker with real, with the, uh, yeah. with yeah. live action people done like they did the Garfield films, which yeah. first started with Bill Murray doing Garfield's voice not very well. Yeah. Uh, I, the yeesh, this is just this, sh- I mean, w- do you know if this was ever going to get a theatrical release or was I, this I, supposed I, to be straight to, straight to DVD? I, it had to be, it had to be, always be a straight to DVD sort of situation, sure right? So. Anyway. You know, Roger Rabbit, years ago when they figured that, I guess they, I guess it goes back longer than you, you had, um, oh, who was Gene Kelly dancing around with, yeah, uh, Tom and Jerry. Yeah, Tom yeah, and Jerry way back yeah. then. Eh, the technology hasn't gotten any better. Well, anyway, the whole thing here is, you know, you got uh, forestation and poachers and Woody's Woody's wood uh, woodpecker's home in the forest is in jeopardy and yada yada. And of course, he does his <laughs> and he's uh, Woody was always really irritating to me. So he, irritating. He, he Walter needed, Walter Lance just, yeah. you know, all those guys kind of came out of the Looney Tunes family, and Walter Lance uh, went bananas and created one of the most annoying characters ever. He just said, "Why don't I make a woodpecker who's ten times more?" More annoying than Bugs Bunny. Yeah. No, yeah. don't do that. No, Woody. Do that. Woody needed the diagnosis. Anyway, so if you, you know, if you're, if you, if you're curious, go ahead and check it out. It's on DVD with a uh, Movies Anywhere uh, code on it. You could, you could store it on your Movies Anywhere digital locker for posterity. Woody Woodpecker. Oh my word. Uh, only the brave. Uh, great cast in this thing. Uh, of, co- of course, about the uh, the Granite Mountain hotshot firefighters, yeah, uh, who lost their lives in uh, one of the recent crazy yeah. freaking. Fires. Uh, this is an amazing story. I I described this at the time as the uh, the best Peter Berg film not made by Peter Berg. Yeah, and uh, isn't not, it though? And, and isn't not it though? starring Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, isn't it though? It is. Uh, Josh Brolin, Miles Teller, Jeff Bridges. James Badge Dale, Taylor Kitsch, and the extraordinary Jennifer Connelly, who only gets more beautiful every second. And she, you know what? Uh, this movie did not get enough no. attention. It really didn't. I, I think partly because it is sort of a, it's such a kind of a, a macho, rah rah hero, Peter Berg type movie. But it really, it's got a lot going for it and a lot of good performances. Jennifer Connelly is tremendous. And there are some really unbelievably strong, heartfelt moments here. And, and, the firefighting stuff's as good as anything I've ever seen. Yeah, better than the, uh, the days of backdrafts. Lots of deleted scenes and commentary oh, and all yeah. kinds of stuff on that, too, yeah. by the way. Uh, we got a really just utterly silly thing here. Keep watching from Sony. This is a straight-to-video, um, uh, th- basically kind of a, a, a horror thriller uh, with, you know, home intruders, and it's a home invasion thing. Um, what's, what's lame about this and there's a st- there's a there's kind of a I don't want to I won't give all the details away there's 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 a whole um, there's a streaming thing to this there's a really exploitative voyeuristic streaming angle to this uh, hence the name keep watching but what's lame about this is how they promote it mm. with the uh, with the it 
artwork, yeah. the artwork from it. Basically, there's a they show it's a camera attached to a whole bunch of balloons, like red and white blood covered balloons. Now, this is a shameless way to basically try to piggyback on it, which was recently released and which is storming everything up yeah. on on uh, DVD and Blu-ray, to say, hey, if you're into it. You'll really like this movie that has nothing to do with it, but we put some balloons in the cover anyway. We're hitting white balloons, and yeah, that's, they, a, that's cynical if they, marketing. If they, had, if they had put clown faces on the red and white balloons, yeah, <laughs> then it would have been a, cynical marketing. This 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 movie here, walking out, uh, Matt Bomber, Josh Wiggins, and Bill Pullman. Bill Pullman particularly good in this movie. This movie is one of those movies that I, you know I had to see it for the show. Yeah. Uh, 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 back when it came out, and it was actually a, a fairly a fairly hard felt and moving. A little movie about this young man uh, who goes to fi- visit his father who he hasn't seen him. Well, his father's one of these sort of outdoorsy types, like still right. hunting and all that kind of stuff. This is like a city kid who, not so much into that, but he does want to see his father and have a relationship with his father. And we have these few moments that we spend with Bull, Bill Pullman, who's the yeah. grandfather of the whole sort of uh, yeah. little triumvirate there. And it's, uh, you know, and some moving stuff. And then something happens, and we end up in this very, very different movie. Yeah, which you know kind of put me off a little bit uh, because it was a little dark, uh, but nevertheless it was one of those endurance sort of films, you yeah. know, where the boy is going to have to do uh, and, and and you know he's going to have to grow up and be a man, one yeah, of those grow up and be a man kind of things. And I don't know, some of that stuff was kind of okay with me. Uh, lovely set out in the uh, out, out, in, out in the wilds of nowhere. Uh, so anyway, kind of a neat movie. Um, so I would check it out. Be- spe- special features behind the scenes footage and a trailer there that you might want to check out too. Uh, the Stolen, um, which is actually another neat little film. Um, Alice Eve, who stars in this film, reminds me of a young Nicole Kidman. Yep. Uh, self of Beautiful Blonde. I like Alice Eve. Uh, I, think I think she's still got her big breakthrough coming. But Yeah, yeah well, yeah, yeah, true. Now, this this is set in, uh, in South Island, New Zealand. It's about this woman who marries a rich guy who's a little bit older than her, and she goes down there to live with him, the ranch, the money, and all that kind of stuff. They have a son. When the when the husband is killed, which is no spoiler, and her son goes missing, she has to marshal all of yeah. her resources to uh, you know catch the murderers of her husband and go get her son back. So it's one of those women, uh, a fish out of water woman, yep. yet on a mission kind of movies. And I got to tell you, I like those. I love I like those quite a lot. Um, so that's kind of a neat movie. Um, the Accident Man. Yeah. Uh, Scott Atkins film. This is uh, this is still floating around uh, th- theaters around and about as we as we speak about this neat film. Not not bad at all. It's about this guy who's a hitman, really 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 good hitman. His whole thing is his hits look like accidents, and the cops can't figure them out. N- needless to say, his 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 uh, his people really like that. His clients, the people who hire him, really like that. Uh, something goes down, and somebody he he knows gets involved in the thing, and before he knows it, uh, he has to go against the kind of folks who have been hiring him uh, to pull off hits and try to save them. You know, Scott Atkins, uh, Michael Jai White, neat little movie, uh, action oriented kind of thing. Watch it on DVD because you had no reason to spend seventeen dollars on this. I can tell you that right now. So we're getting a lot of uh, kind of horror-themed stuff coming over from uh, Halloween. That's all coming out now in January and February. And uh, one of them is The Houses October Built 2. Now, I did not see The Houses October Built 1, mm. but clearly uh, the, uh, the uh, story is pretty much the same. You're kind of, as I, as I get the sense, you kind of pick up after these kids have been terrorized by this group called the Blue Skeleton which is like a like a bunch of sadists who love to <laughs> spook the daylights out of you, and they just go they little they go a little bit overboard, and uh, so these these kids are like, wow, glad that's over, and of course it all starts all over again. <laughs> uh, so it ain't over, no. Uh, so it, it's it's fine. I mean, it's a kind of generic scares, but um, I guess if they, you know they, they wouldn't have made a second one if the first one didn't have a certain popularity. So yeah, well, I got one, a, I got I got that I got, I got one a, of those over here. Take a <laughs> well, uh, d- dig on in. <laughs> Tyler Perry's boob too. Oh no! Exclamation point. Yeah. <laughs> Which I love the exclamation point. <laughs> boob too. Exclamation boob point. Boob too. <laughs> So 2016 yeah. gave us Tyler Perry's Boo. Yeah. <laughs> this is Boo too. Look, this is what I have to say about. Uh, I've, first of all, let me say that I've gotten over myself regarding <laughs> Tyler Perry and Medea and Medea. Got, got no, I'm over myself. Yeah. I have uh, been poking at these movies for ne- for nigh on the 15 years now. Yeah. 
And, and, and I realized that that guy has built an empire and does not give a damn yep. <laughs> about my okay. about me whining about, about his movies over here. So go for it, Tyler Perry. Yep. These movies are actually quite funny, which is why they made a second one. You know, yep. that, that's, just a, that's just the bottom of the line. And this is what I will say about these movies. You know, um, for a filmmaker to be able to simply make the movies that they want to make the way that they want to make them, uh, on their own accord, without anybody green lighting them, it's a hell of a thing to achieve in this town. And we pat you know a lot of people on the back. Christopher Nolan is a guy that can do that. We pat him on the back. Uh, Zack Snyder is a guy who can do that. We pat him on the back. Tyler Perry is a guy who can do that. Yep. And you know what? Pat on the back, yep. Tyler. Make yep. as many of these dumbass movies as you want to. And yeah, here's another one: uh, Inoperable with. Uh, the and when he, you always know when you have names above the title and you've never heard of these people, you know what you're dealing with. Uh, Inoperable is a Cinedime release uh, starring Danielle Harris, Jeff Denton, and Katie Keene. Yeah, <laughs> look, I wish you all the best. I'm glad you got starring names, but I don't know who any of you are. Uh, so uh, the idea here is that uh, it's all it's one of these claustrophobic horror films with something you know something's going on outside, and the something going on outside is a hurricane. And there's a woman inside this uh, this abandoned hospital, and uh, what's going on with the hurricane? Well, there's, there's some kind of some kind of supernatural thing related to the hurricane, and it all gets very spooky and, and lots of screaming and dark, shadowy hospital stuff. And uh, you know, the horror films keep going back to hospitals, I guess, because people have a hospital phobia. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, all right. Anyway, it's called Inoperable. It is. Um, it is serviceable for the uh, for the gimmick that it uh, tries to exploit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a bad mom's Christmas. You know, this I suppose capitalized on that little run of. Yeah, I guess go back to the bridesmaids now. Sure, maybe a little further, but there. Yeah. yeah. And we've had these run of movies with the ladies. Yeah. Uh, out and about doing things that otherwise would have happened in the movie with a bunch of boys. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they're loud yeah. and they're rude and they're crude and they're obnoxious, but they're still good moms. Uh, and we still love them, and you know they're <laughs> they're all hot. So I don't know what I, that's a theme in these things. Uh, and I suppose they're funny. I don't find them particularly funny. But let me, to my defense, let me say that I didn't find the one with the boys funny either. No, I mean wh- every fifth one, every fifth one. Well, this movie was not made for you or for me. No, <laughs> no. this no. is made for uh, this is made for for women who uh, are yearning for their youth yeah. and they're they're raising kids. And they're wondering what happened, and uh, they just want a little release, want to feel a little bit crazy again. And this is kind of a cathartic thing. It's not very good, but I totally get why it's popular. Mila Kunis, uh, uh, Christian Bale, Catherine Hahn, Cheryl Hines, Christine Baranski, who's always actually playing. And Susan Sarandon. Yep. Uh, Kill Order. The perfect weapon. The ultimate target. Who comes up with these taglines? I should have a job. (laughs) I should employ I me to come write up with those, taglines. You know. I know you did. I know <laughs> it's funny. Anyway, uh, so this is one of those kind of action martial arts things that is made here um, that aspires to look more like what they make over there, meaning in mm. Hong Kong and in China and Indonesia and Vietnam, who are making all the great martial arts stuff these days. So uh, a guy named uh, Chris Mark stars in this thing, and it's basically kind of a kind of an ET ish X Men stories kid with the mem- weird memories and superpowers, and yeah. a bunch of people storm the school because they want him for whatever secret experimental reason that he represents something. So he has to go on the run, and he his superpowers, his mutant super martial arts abilities manifest themselves, and we get a lot of action stuff, and they're fine. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know I don't know what the relationship is between Chris Mark, who stars in this and James Mark, who wrote and directed it. I'm going to assume that they are brothers. And uh, more, t- more power to them, you know, knock yourselves out. Uh, it's not, it, you know, it's, it's very formulaic, but it's, it's perfectly competent. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a fan of the serious martial arts stuff, you won't much like it. But. Mm. And then we also on, on DVD have uh, Red Dog True Blue. It's another dog movie. There will never be an end to them. Uh, we've had them for 80-some years, and we will yeah. continue to. Uh, this is about a kid, played by Levi Miller, who goes off to Granddad's, and he finds a scrappy little dog and falls in love with the dog. And that's it. It's a kid and a dog. And, and you know, the only thing that's more uh, that's that's more entrenched in Hollywood lore are kids and horses. <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah, you that's know, it. Uh, kids bl- and dogs, kids, kids and horses. Kids and dogs, kids and horses, and... 
For some reason, kids and cats and hamsters never really caught on. But boy, anyway, it's Red Dog, True Blue. Um, this won the Heartland Film Festival last year. And it actually had a had a presence at uh, Berlin and uh, and Toronto and Sundance and you know it's got a deleted scenes and alternate ending bit in here nothing that's really that significant but it is uh, of this genre it is above average so I'll I'll be fair to it and say that mm. uh, this uh, girl without hands is an extraordinarily beautiful film uh, just animation yeah uh, and um, it's a it's a fairy tale uh, but it, for me it was a little bit on the uh, brutal side as yeah. it sort of works its way through yeah. the, these sort of stories. The, the animation is absolutely extraordinary. Very simple, sort of almost a gouache and sort of line drawing kind of thing that we were talking about before. But it was dazzling. Uh, and uh, if you don't, if you do not mind uh, watching uh, the sort of uh, original incarnation of a grim fairy tale, uh, which are always darker and more brutal and uh, than than the ones that we've come to know, uh, then you you really will be watching an extraordinarily lovely, lovely piece of animation. Sebastian Lautenbach. Uh, this happens to have the bonus features, uh, including an interview with this, uh, with Sebastian and some of his other short films and whatnot. Geostorm, another Ger Gerard Butler movie. Gerard has become this guy <laughs> who who puts himself in these big sort of outlandish. Sort of, he's in Den of Thieves right now. Yeah, movies. Uh, that are perfectly ludicrous, uh, but you know they have a good cast. They have and they have this sort of big sort of uh, yeah. uh, you, you know you know uh, apocalyptic themes or whatnot. This one, Geostorm, him, Jim Sturgis, Abby Cornish, Ed Harris, Andy Garcia. The whole idea is that the weather's going crazy, so uh, the world leaders build this sort of like satellite network of uh, this network of satellites that are meant to control the weather, and somehow the network of satellites get out of control and start creating storms all over this. So we have to figure out, that. and of course Gerard Butler. The guy you want to call when that's happening? Uh, you know Gerard Butler. I just I, he could have had a much better career, and he yeah. just I don't know who picks his. I stuff. mean, coming off Phantom of the Opera, which was not a big hit, but he's you know, he, he displayed some real chops there. He's and then of course Spartacus, big old actiony thing, and then and then what? He's just been he's just turned into. He's just turned into a generic action film hack, and it's really sad. I, I don't – anyway. Yeah, one for the I money. Guess, Some know, people do. And I and you know what? Yeah, take fine. the payday. I, I know. I, I'd like to see him do better work, but you know what? I'm sure he's got boat payments. Yeah. Uh, 24 Hours to Live, starring Ethan Hawke. He'll stop when he's dead. Another favorite tagline. <laughs> uh, so here's the deal. The people who made John Wick decided, hey, let's make another John Wick. Uh, um, who's – Who's about Keanu Reeves' age? Who <laughs> who needs a who needs a shot in the eye? Ethan Hawke. Yeah. Now here's the thing. Ethan Hawke is a guy that I would have nominated for an Oscar this year uh, for his role in Maudie. If you didn't oh, see yeah. Maudie, Maudie yeah. is a wonderful Canadian movie. That's another movie. one. That's one. Yeah. But Maudie fell a little bit off the radar because uh, uh, Sally Hawkins, who stars in Maudie as the famous Canadian folk artist of the title. Um, it was also in The Shape, Shape of Water, Water yeah. so that's the Sally Hawkins that's movie. That's the flashier of, performance. The flashier performance. She's kind of a mute, you know, so they elevate it. She's sort of, she's she's d kind of handicapped, disabled in both of them. Yeah. Uh, Maudie is a little bit slow in the head and has kind of clubbed feet and, you know, has all these family issues. I mean, the story of Maudie is amazing. Anyway, Ethan Hawke plays Maudie's husband. It's tremendous. It's the best performance he's ever given, but Maudie fell off the radar. <laughs> So Ethan Hawke said, screw it. I'm going to do action film stuff. Give me a couple of guns. So he stars in 24 Hours to Live where he just shoots people and it's just, you know, he's he, he used to be special ops and he's come back in to take... Uh, all right. It's one of those. It's basically John Wick. Same deal. Uh, and uh, there's a, you know... It's, it's, it's basically the same thing. So anyway, 24 Hours to Live... Uh, it's the 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 title comes from kind of a DOA thing. If you've seen DOA, they kind of yeah. merge this with DOA, and it's a, you know, it's a it, it, it's a it's a cheat. Uh, it's still just an excuse for Ethan Hawke to play action hero, and he's fine at it. It's just not a very good movie. Um, but he gives it his all, and I do like Ethan Hawke, but I just want him to do more films like Maudie. It, it, it's funny, Ethan Hawke, in in cert, in a certain way, was James Franco before James Franco. Yeah, it's He's, true. You know, with the writing yeah. novels and yeah. every possible kind of movie, and yeah. you, you know, the little TV over and all that kind of stuff like that. Uh, uh, yeah. But you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, interesting thing. Um, the Tiger Hunter. 
Uh, neat little movie, actually, about this. Uh, it's set in the 70s. Yeah. It's, it's this Indian immigrant. He's this guy who's coming to the United States to be an engineer and, uh, and, and, and all of that. And he falls in love with this girl. And he has this father back in India who was this great tiger hunter. And when he gets here, his job sort of goes away and all this kind of stuff. And he falls in with these, this group of goofy guys. And uh, it, it's all about him trying to impress this girl and make, him, make, make himself seem like a bigger and more important person than he actually is. It is actually quite, quite funny. Uh, and it is the directorial debut of Lena Khan, yep. uh, a, a female uh, writer director of color, uh, who I think you know. At the we should just make note. You know, yeah, the, 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 there she is knocking this movie out. Kevin Pollak, Sam Page. It's a neat little movie. Good with, deal. With John he Hitter, you know, the, the Napoleon yeah. Dynamite sure. years ago. You know, these little movies though. All right, so I, I say all of that. I like this movie. It's really cute. Not a lot, but a special feature on here, by the way, uh, the making of the movie. Um, but this movie here. Did not get a theatrical release. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's a decent cast, that's man. That's a great cast. That this should is, get you some kind of a release. That and should I'm put you in the theaters. 10, 12 years ago, this is in theaters for, for, for a minute, anyway. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. You know, something's going to have to happen. There are, there are screens that are begging to have butts in the seats. And uh, I don't know why. I don't know why it's just not working out. Anyway, uh, George Clooney and Grant Heslov. Uh, yeah. Suburbicon. George Clooney now, kind of bonked it. Cohen Brothers yeah. kind of fake Cohen well, Brothers thing. It's you know what? Here's the thing. I mean, Suburbicon. It's it's the you know what what lurks under the surface of the idyllic uh, '50s neighborhood, and Matt Damon and his family move in, and things are not what they seem to be. You know, it's uh, it's the Stepford neighborhood or whatever you might want to put it. Uh, and here's the thing. I love George Clooney. I love him as a filmmaker. Everything he's done with Grant Heslop, I, I've even even the ones that like good the football night, the good football night, movie, good luck, uh, Leatherheads, Leatherheads. I even like Leatherheads, which nobody else liked. Um, but there's a problem here, and that is that they're trying to send a message, mm. and it would be a little bit more forgivable. First of all, Matt Damon in all of his, his is in a is in a rut right now between this and the the well, Alexander the Payne film, downsizing, yeah. which are sort of trying to say similar things. Also, uh, not not good choices. Although, how do you turn down Alexander Payne and George Clooney. Well, you know, I mean, it's just th those are two hard projects to turn down. So I can't really blame him. But here's the thing. I was also thinking Suburbicon, if Get Out had not done basically the same thing more effectively, I think people might not have been quite so hard on this film. Mm. But I think Get Out raised the bar of what lurks beneath the surface. Yeah. Right. Of all of this, this pretense and, you know. Uh, what appears to sort of be uh, idyllic Americana or some kind of an idyllic family in the case of Get Out, if that scab weren't already scratched so effectively in Get Out, I think people might have looked at Suburbicon a little more forgivingly. Yeah, subversion. Once you once you start getting into subversion, then the next film has to be somehow yes, more subversive. That's it. The yeah. bar yeah. goes up. Goes up. Yep. It goes up. Uh, we got some TV. Let's let's hit a little bit of TV to kind of wrap things out. We got a whole bunch of uh, complete series box sets that were released last year and that, uh, you know, fell under the radar a little bit. So they're back on our radar, and one of them well, – we, I'll, I'll save some of these bigger ones later. One of them is Under the Dome, a uh, complete series from Amblin Television, which is a Stephen King adaptation. And Didn't uh, make it all the way through that one. Yeah, you know. You know, when it was in broadcast. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a nice box set. It's a nice big single uh, clear plastic keep case. So you don't have a lot of different little, you know, slots and things to deal with. And it's not cheesy packaging like a lot of them are. But, um, and I didn't read the original book. No. So I don't know. No. I don't know how faithful this is, uh, but it it does it does feel a little bit uh, forced in some ways. I mean, the idea of um, this town that suddenly is covered by a dome and has to exist as its own sort of independent uh, little, little yeah, society, nation state, yeah. nation state ecosystem, whatever. Um, it's an interesting idea. It's basically Gilligan's Island, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, on a grander scale, but it doesn't really. Do what Gilligan's Island did so well, and when you, you you have the every opportunity to do so, yeah. And Gilligan's Island does it with humor, and well, it's one of the, it's one of those satire. things where where unexpected people. Uh, so the guy who it's lost, yeah, under you know, a dome, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't need lost under a dome. I already had lost on an island, yeah, which was Gilligan's Island without the jokes, yeah, and, and lots of flashbacks. No, 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 no. magical smoke monster. Though. No, exactly. Uh, so under the dome, uh, didn't really work for me. 
uh, I, lately, I, I've been watching Vegas, uh, the, ro- <sighs> the uh, old Robert Garrick, uh, just fantastic Best series show. on television. He and par- as he I've been parked w- his car in his living room, in his li- he just drove it's right the in there. Best thing, thing in the world. Stingray. A car with a car phone in the That's middle seventies. Right. Yep. Let me point out, so yep. like uh, mo- mobile phone there. And Great when I've been show. watching it lately, right, uh, and just watching him walk around that show, and it's you know, obviously set sure. in Vegas and you know, Phil Morris and all that kind of stuff. I'm looking at the show, and, and and everything is so incredibly modern. He is completely contemporary. I mean, a, a wide lapel here or there. But other than that, you watch that show, and, and, and plus I love watching all of the hotels that are not there anymore. He's driving right in front of them all the time. All the time. He's driving right in front. Plus this show, uh, and this, by the way, is a complete series, all 67 episodes on 18 discs plus special features. Best show. You go through this show, and you see yourself. Uh, who do you see? You, you, you see oh. you, you, Lou Gossett Jr. Guest stars uh, galore. Guest stars galore. I mean, you just go. O.J. Simpson shows up in it. Yeah. I mean, you just go through this show. Yeah. And they just pop up. They pop up. They pop Great. up. Young as young as, as as ever. And anyway, love this show. Uh, and the great Greg Morris from Mission Impossible. So course, good playing the lieutenant in this show. The whole it, it, let me let series. me tell you something. There's a there's something to be learned from Vegas. And they recently announced the uh, a, a new greatest American hero. Uh, which I kind oh, of yeah, went, <laughs> well, I went off on because <laughs> it's it's basically got nothing to do with Greatest American Hero. So I'm going to take exception with you on that. Though. Well, here's the thing: like they've got a new show. There's this new show they're going to do about a a, a young overweight uh, Indian American woman who uh, becomes a superhero and is really awkward about it. Now, fine, call that something else. Don't call <laughs> it Greatest American Hero. This uh, is, but remember, rem- and I, I meant to write a note yeah. about this because the thing about the greatest American hero is, if we remember the show, yes, it didn't have anything to do with the person. The aliens had the suit. suit. He, he the suit he wasn't even, and then the old guy who had previously been the great gave him the suit. Uh, yeah, and it, with no instruction manual, so it's the suit. It's the suit that makes the hero. It is indeed the suit that makes the hero. But what made the show? Was not the hero. No. It was the chemistry <laughs> between three people. <laughs> between, right? uh, yeah. Robert Culp and yeah. Connie Salica were as much the stars of that show as William Cat. Oh yeah, he and, wore and, the and suit. The, and, and the kids, because remember he was a high school teacher. Yeah, he had the whole sweat hawks thing That's going. That's right. And a little bit later, the kids would run around with. That's him. right. And and the 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 sheer enjoyment of the show was the chemistry, which is that you had Robert Culp with his just. Hard ass government <laughs> conspiratorial commies are coming to get us. I know it's the Russians, like that whole vibe going. And then <sighs> Connie Selica, who had to kind of balance him out with some sanity and a little bit of sexual tension. It was a really smart ensemble. And where I'm going with that is, it's the same thing with Vegas. Wow. Yeah, it's about Dan Tana. But it's not. No, it's that it's family. It's about all of them. It's it, it's it a, was it, a little. It was a little. The lieutenant and then Bart. Uh, is, yeah, Liz, guy running guy around. Running around. With, you know, and the secretary. And B they, they, was an ex. Yeah, dancer, strip, she'd be in a dancer. Or right. It's like all these people have these this baggage and these backgrounds, and it's that ensemble. And you tune in every week to see them. Basic. It, Starskin Hutch. Yeah. Okay. Starskin Hutch is great, but it still needs Huggy Bear. Yeah, it still needs have the Captain whole Doby. You gotta it's have still, Dad. You gotta that's have it. The, gotta have the, the crazy that's uncle. It. That's it. Huggy's. It's all, they're all just families. Yep. That's all they it's ever all are. That's all they are. Somebody's the big, somebody's dad, somebody's the uncle. That's all they ever are. Rockford needs his dad. And yeah, it's Rockford, his actual dad. And he, need, and he <laughs> needs Joe, uh, what's Angel, his name? Angel, Angel, what's and his name? Need, and Joe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, all that stuff. You gotta have all the... It, if you it, don't have the family, it doesn't work. Magnum P.I. We love Rick. Magnum, but he needs Rick and T.C. Yeah. And he for needs that Higgins. Higgins. And the dogs. You know, and for that matter, Robin, Robin Masters, who never really may or may not be... These shows are about the ensembles. It's, uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, War of the Worlds, the complete series. Don't know why this ever had to be a series. Probably why it wound up only being 43 episodes. 11 discs. Still more episodes I than it should have been. I watched that back in the 80s. You know, I mean... I, it, it didn't make any sense because, you know, it was set 50... 
it started it started to make sense and then it lost yeah. it. It was it was set fifty years after the events of right. War of the Worlds, right? right? And somehow there was this national uh, memory loss about those events, right? The yeah. whole nation had simply – it had been written off. It didn't really happen. Kind of like what happens today, you know, when they, when they – all those people who deny the moon landing. Yes. It was, it was supposed to have been one of those, except yeah. that it did happen, and all of these aliens were in these 50-gallon uh, drums that had been buried, and then something happens, and they start coming back. And it's, it becomes kind of a post-apocalyptic yeah. in, slash and invasion then it slips thing. off into, a go, into, into the goofy zone. But that was an interesting idea. They just yeah. could, they couldn't they – couldn't, they couldn't hold on to it. Well, you know, you, what, the, what they need to do is they need to figure out – can we get three seasons out of this? At because least. that syndicate was that that show was a was one of the early late eighties late eighties yeah. uh, 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 syndicated uh, shows yeah. as opposed to a network yeah. show. Yeah. And yeah. you got and, and to, to make money in syndication, you got to have at least what do they, what do they say about at least 80, 90 episodes yeah. something. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, and sell it this thing went up with forty three yeah. uh, about two get, seasons. Didn't quite get there. Didn't quite get there. But anyway, I mean, there's some laudable stuff in it. But it, it, like Tim says, it's just not enough to sustain a series. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's out there as well on eleven discs. Uh, Duckman, uh, <laughs> the complete series. I, th- we were talking about, you know, uh, some of the wacky uh, yeah. lo- and all this kind of stuff. Duckman was one that I actually rather liked. It, it kind of got there for me, mostly because he was sarcastic. Yeah, uh, I, I and, like Duckman. And, and, you know, and all the little ducks went around. Anyway, this is the complete series, Private Dick Family Man. Duck Man, Private Dick, Family Man. So, uh, all kinds of special features, uh, features on this. Too many uh, to mention. If you're a fan of the series, you're a fan of the series. Sure. Right? Yeah. It's fun. Uh, the Guardian, the complete series. Uh, three seasons, 67 episodes. Almost got there to that syndication bit. Uh, you know, The Guardian was a show I watched a little bit at the time. Uh, this ran about 2001 to 2004. And didn't really like it so much then. I like it more now, to be honest. It's... Uh, this is kind of a, a boilerplate television legal show, but um, some really, you know, and Simon, this is the thing that sort of broke Simon Baker through, uh, the, you know, and yeah. he still needs to, he, he's, he's not, still not as big of a star as I thought he would be. No, yeah, I thought he was going to be a movie star. But the he, Mentalist the was mentalist, the he next ended thing up being that he did. Sort of television guy, yeah. Uh, but The Guardian is what sort of was his first thing, and... Quasi uh, Ed, Ed, Edward Woodward, uh, yeah. uh, the equalizer, quasi kind of, equalizer yeah. e. So, anyway, uh, Dabney Coleman plays his dad, who's, you know, this big Pittsburgh attorney, and uh, Alan Rosenberg plays an attorney as well, who's always really, really good, always liked Alan Rosenberg. Uh, you know, interesting, really interesting show, it has a lot of resonance for me now, more than it did at the time. Um, probably more resonance, because I've seen Simon Baker in the grocery store a few times, and I'm like... <laughs> Wow, you really look good, dude. My, I'm, my mom was I'm, nuts about it. I'm him. impressed. Uh, he buy he buys low fat yogurt. <laughs> Just want to let you everyone. I, it's at the lo- I always see him buying low fat yogurt. <laughs> my mom, my mom would say, "I'm getting ready to watch that show with that pretty white boy." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, w- 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 which one? <laughs> which one, mom? She's like, you know the one. <laughs> like, never, yeah, never mind. Anyway, she was talking about him. Uh, Tom Hanks, Peter Scolari, and Buds and Buddies, 1980, the complete series. Yep. Actually, only 37 episodes because Tom mm-hmm. Tom bailed yeah. kind of early on that on that on yeah. that show. Uh, I, I you know, dude, I look back at this show, and because this is this Tom had made a movie maybe in the middle 70s, yeah. uh, or, or two, but I don't know. I, I might have seen them, maybe I didn't. Uh, I certainly don't remember them. But once I saw Tom Hanks and Bosom Buddies, right. I followed him for the rest I did too. of you know, thus far my I life know. and his career. I did too. I saw he came and his run on Family Ties. He had that run on Family Ties where yeah. he pay, played uh, yeah. know, Alex's uncle or something like yeah. that. Uh, and then all of those early movies, a couple of hits. Splash uh, and uh, Bachelor Man Party. Man One Red Shoe Man, and all, yeah. this, all that kind of stuff. But it all began right here. It sure did. The guy that Tom Hanks plays, when he plays in comedies, anyway. And, this is, and let's, be, let's be honest. This is basically some like it hot as a TV yeah, show. Yeah, it's a TV show. It, literally. It's yeah. literally that. It's, it's Three's, company, and, Three's Company meets some like it hot. Uh, and what's weird is, so I'm watching this I'm watching this show in the early 80s, you know, Homie and Bridge. We yeah. love this show. She's bananas about Tom and the show. Yeah. Eventually, we move here, right? Yep. And every single person in this show, I eventually meet and interview. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, 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 multiple times. Something yeah. like every Donna Dixon. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's every single. And I'm just saying the entire cast of Book of Buddies. I've I've actually had an interaction with. Which, I mean, uh, it was it was adorable. a smart idea. They said Three's Company works. Some people need a place to stay. Housing's tough. Hey, let's have them just dress as women, like in uh, in in something like it hot. They were really kind of getting away with it because there was this this show contains the notion of a female only hotel, yeah. which was an ordinary thing in all yeah. the movies of the fifties and yeah. in, in the sixties, Doris Day and all that kind of. That was that was true. By the time you get to the early eighties, there are no more female no, only no. hotels. No, it doesn't. No, that's, that's ludic- that. ludicrous. Uh, dude, I still love Star Trek the animated series. I do too. Mark doesn't. Good thing he's not here. What? Mark what? hates it. What? He hates all that filmation stuff. This I is think good that though. It's it's totally good. They got the original voices and they were able to do things that they couldn't do on the regular show because of special effects, they costs, can get outside or whatever. The spaceship with, yeah. the little, with the little force field. They could do a lot of things in do. animation. It really it expanded the Star Trek uh, canon, as it were, in a really interesting way. The I still scores think it's a great were show. great. Terrific. The, 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 of this, I mean, you know, yeah. they were loops, but they were it was yeah. really good stuff. Anyway, uh, uh, audio commentaries, all kinds of stuff here. Star Trek the animated series on Blu-ray. Uh, on Blu-ray, fantastic. And then we've got the Andy Griffith Show, the complete series, all 249 <laughs> episodes in a box set. The packaging is a little flimsy. It's, uh, it looks it's, good, it, but it's just sort of it's like, flimsy. cardboardy. It's yeah. cardboardy uh, in a sleeve. Cu- in a sleeve. Uh, but still, and this is not Blu-ray, they started releasing the first two seasons on Blu-ray. Mm. And they have not continued. And I'm not quite sure why. And my guess is that that's a decision over at Paramount. To pull the plug on that, which means we will probably see Shout Factory releasing them uh, as Blu-ray at some point. Shout Factory tends to do that. They did that with Green Acres, right? When they see the shows that other that studios have released only a few seasons of, and then they pulled the plug because they don't know how to reach the audience. Shout Factory's got your back. So I'm holding out hope that we're going to get complete uh, Andy Griffith on Blu-ray from Shout Factory if they can work something out with Paramount. I'm going to be talking to the people at Shout Factory soon. I'll let you know if I find anything pa- out. Pa- anyway, Paramount, all it takes to help. Yeah, but in the in the in the time being, uh, we can you know here it is all 249 episodes, all eight seasons in a box set on DVD, not Blu-ray, and uh, it's great. Lots of extra stuff on here. Uh, you even have the uh, the crossover when you know uh, Gomer goes and joins the Marines, and then you know we then yeah. Fred Fred. <laughs> uh, Fred, uh, 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 who played uh, Gomer's uh, cousin? Oh, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Goober. Yeah, Goober, but yeah, but Fred, uh, the Gamer actor. Well, anyway, yeah. from from uh, from uh, the from uh, the, the southern show. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, hee haw, hee haw. Thank you. Yeah. Boy, my brain is not Gomer working Gomer. today. Yeah. yeah. Are there, are there, uh, uh, we just lost Gomer uh, or, or Jim did. Neighbors. Jim Neighbors, yeah. Uh, but I but I think, is Goober still around? Yeah, I think he is. Goober's still around. Okay, yeah. yeah. We'll have to check that out. Because uh, we're, we're down to almost, uh, hell, we're down to nobody but uh, Richie Cunningham, who is uh, Pretty Opie. much, yeah. Right? Down to Ron Howard. Down to Ron Howard. Man, down to Ron Howard. Ron Aunt B had been around, been around oh, for Aunt a B's long been time. Gone. Well, yeah, about 10 years. Yeah, she's been gone from me. Andy a couple of years ago, yeah. actually. Yeah. Oh, well, there it is. And uh, Hawaii Five-0, Ooh, the boy, complete look at that series. Box. This is a beautiful box. Now, Hawaii Five-0 has been out on DVD for a long time. Has never been out on Blu-ray. It's still not out on Blu-ray. They should go back, because these shows were all shot on film. Yeah. And they were shot really well on film. Yeah. And a lot of great Hawaiian scenery there. They should Yeah, they go made back. use of the actual Hawaiian locations. They sure did. So uh, they need to go back. And get all that source material, all that film material, and you remaster that, and you time it, and you color correct it, and you put that stuff out on Blu-ray, damn it. Uh, I want it done. But in the meantime, you can get this big, giant, gorgeous DVD box set of all of Hawaii Five-0, the entire 12-some-odd-year run of this thing. Uh, that went from 1968 to 1980, covers the 70s. And man, yeah. what a great show. Tim and I talk about this all the time. Yeah. 73 discs. Damn it, 73 discs. Uh, you get a vintage documentary on here, too, Hawaii Five O, Hawaii Now, and uh, the syndication sales reel and, you know, Mike Douglas show appearance for Jack Lord. Uh, a lot of really good stuff on here, but uh, ultimately it's the show that you're watching. Kicks the crap out of the current, or the you know, the, oh our, our my contemporary gosh, Hawaii no Five O in terms of yeah, it, it, first of all, Jack Lord. So there you go. Yeah. Cam Fong, you know, it, it, all of no that comparison. Just kicks the crap out of all of that. Not to mention, again, with the uh, the cast of characters uh, yep. that you see. I mean, uh, you got Gavin McCloud playing a pimp yep. <laughs> in an episode, a scary Super. ass pimp too. Uh, uh, and I and I have to say this too. I still think the premiere episode 
of Hawaii Five O, which introduces Wo Fat, the, yes. the 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 villain, a very Batman like villain who you know comes always back, gets away, and keeps back, coming yeah. back. Um, is a tremendous piece of television. It is still a tremendous piece of television. It is creepy and eerie, and it, it feels very espionage-y. It feels very Avengers, you yeah. know? It, it's got a really, it's a great 60s vibe to it. Very, the prisoner, right? This little kind of a British spy vibe to it. It's just, it's great television, and the show lived up to all of that. Well, The Edge, what always, we talk about this all the time, The Edge of those shows from the late 60s, early yeah. 70s, this one, uh, Starsky and Hutch, all of them, right? The Streets Subject of San Francisco. Man. Yeah. Street stamps, subject matter. Yeah. Uh, plenty of it could yeah. not be the subject matters of shows on the air today that true. air in the same time slots anyway. True. Yeah. yeah. All true. television. Couldn't do it. So, uh, Hawaii Five-0, man, that is that is a giant, beautiful brick of a complete show, but uh, I got to highly recommend it. It's going to be a long time before that thing shows up on Blu-ray. So, uh, if you want to get some good TV on, it's tough to find, too. I think it's on Netflix. It mm-hmm. might be on Amazon, but uh, it comes and goes. So, if you want your Hawaii Five-0, you gotta, got you got to get this set. All right, with that, uh, we are done. We will be back next week, and email us at gods at digigods.com. We'll have plenty of other fun things coming up on the cinegods.com site as well, and we will talk to you guys next week. 